Right, welcome. Um, we're going to have, try and have quite a snappy debate. Um, we're going to get each of the panel to, to um, try and encapsulate their answer to the question behind us in only one minute before we then go to a slightly bigger debate and then bring a lot of you in, because there's an awful lot of expertise in the room we want to get involved. Um, can I just ask for a show of hands to start with um, on this question? How many of you agree with the question that Europe is falling behind other world leaders in green growth? How many people agree? Hmm, not very many. And how many people disagree? Okay, so we have quite a... So you think Europe is, is holding its own. Um, that's quite interesting because I was reflecting um, after Doha that, you know, Kyoto has um, achieved eight more years of life. But on the other hand, um, the terrible thing about Kyoto is when you look back at all the machinations and all the campaigning and all the effort that's been put into that and some of the other uh, EU policies, and you look at the US, which of course didn't ratify Kyoto and hasn't set uh, many environmental targets. When you look at the emissions trends between America and Europe, of course, you see at the moment America's greenhouse gas emissions falling and Europe's not falling. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but um, it makes me slightly skeptical as to whether I agree with the majority in this room. Um, now, I'm going to open up to the panel and we're going to go in order. And um, it, if it is quite a, an onerous um, thing to ask you to speak for one minute. I've got a very old-fashioned watch here, which doesn't actually have a second hand, so I'll do my best to, to keep to time. Um, we're going to chart with James Smith, chairman of the Carbon Trust, um, who, of course, uh, was at Shell, uh, chairman of Shell UK for many years and um, has done many, many great things since retiring from Shell. Um, James, can you kick my off one with minute, your please, one it? minute? <laughs> So I think the answer to the first part of the question is yes, and I suppose we'll get into discussions about root cause, and I suspect that, at least in relative terms, uh, compared even with its major competitors like the US and China, there's a lack of political cohesion in Europe, and of course that makes it vulnerable not only to these big zones, but also to smaller, nimbler competitors, such as Korea. And the lack of political cohesion can either result in stalemate or in not as good policy as we might want, for example, in good option management and development on new technologies. Um, I'm just wondering why so many people voted yes, and I, I, because one of the things I was going to say, and it may be relevant to this, is that Europe does seem to be extremely good at making grand statements and high-level commitments and developing policies and putting together plans, what it seems to be less effective at doing, and Camilla referred to some of it, uh, is actually implementing those things. And I think it's in the implementation that Europe falls behind. I think it matters for one big reason and one gigantic reason. The big reason is, of course, if Europe falls behind economically, that's a pity for Europe. Uh, the other gigantic reason is if Europe falls behind, we may not deliver on the project because so much needs to be done in the development of new technologies, including carbon negative, that we don't just need the United States and China and Korea and Singapore to do this very effectively. Europe needs to be as effectively as it possibly can be as well. My worry is if we're not in Europe, then the project suffers. Thank you, excellent. Um, I'll turn to Jason Ice, who's Deputy Director of the Global Green Growth Institute, and of course, previously to that, did work for the Carbon Trust, where he developed innovation strategies. Jason. Great, thank you. I usually enjoy being a contrarian, so I'm disappointed to say that I, I actually agree with the audience here. I don't think um, Europe is falling behind, but it's nothing to be proud of. Um, in general, it's because the rest of the world isn't going nearly as fast as it should be. Um, the, you know, the way I look at it, um, we work with a number of developing countries. I'm going to leave the United States aside. I'm going to focus on the rest of the developing world. Well, the, I shouldn't say that. Most of Europe is <laughs> developed. But um, no, but essentially, I think you know, where a country stands in green growth, you can think about it in terms of the policies it has. I think you can think about it in terms of the companies it has and how its companies are or aren't attuned to the potential risks and advantages, and where its consumers are in terms of whether they care at all. And frankly speaking, in none of the other leading developing countries are there consumers that really care. Um, they just don't. I mean, Europe's miles ahead of most other countries when it comes to that. I think there's some companies that are opportunistic about it, but there aren't nearly as many companies as there are in Europe which have fundamentally rethought their business models around what, what, might, what there might need to be. And when it comes to policies, sadly, most countries are still trying to catch up with um, the UK. And I think those, not the UK, Europe, and those, and those that have done a little bit better, um, 
like, let's say, China in, in some elements of expanding its renewable energy, they've maybe only seen it as an investment, but actually it is a cost and an investment, Tom. And I think actually most other countries are way behind Europe in terms of understanding that. And one of the, the critical things about making the green growth challenge work is minimizing the cost and optimizing the investments. And I, I actually personally think many countries like Brazil even or, or China have run out well ahead in terms of thinking about investment, but are way behind in terms of understanding what are the optimal paths towards achieving this, this future um, while keeping costs down and improving resource productivity, the fundamentals of what, what will drive green growth. So I'm, I'm not necessarily optimistic about <laughs> Europe, but I guess the, the global picture isn't that bright. So um, I go for we're okay so far. Um, Tora Land, Director of Eco-Imagination at GE, um, who previously was President and CEO of, is it Pemias? How do you pronounce that? Yeah. Everyone in this room probably knows it and I don't. Fuel cell technologies. So um, you really know what you're doing when it comes to energy. One minute. I think my answer to the question is, yes, Europe is falling behind, in particular on the growth element. You see, what I find fascinating is, and of course, GE has exposure globally to countries, markets, different markets. Europe has all the ingredients needed to drive growth. We have the intent and commitment of political stakeholders. There's support of legislation out there. There's a lot of outstanding technology out there, great entrepreneurs. But somehow Europe is lacking the structure and the processes to take all these ingredients and to translate this into growth. Growth in a sense that really is intent to lower the carbon footprint of the power industry to reduce the carbon footprint of an entire geography. And that all this leads to aggressive investments into the technologies needed to accomplish this. Europe is good on the first part, on the green thinking, so to speak, and the interest of becoming green, but we are not so good in really translating this into investments, which alter into in particular in technologies and new assets, which support the term growth. So, I think as far as the term green is concerned, we are pretty much okay. As far as the term growth is concerned, we are not okay. So ultimately, I think my answer is yes, we are falling behind. Thank you. Dimitri Zangelis is senior, senior visiting fellow at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at LSE, and he headed the Stern Review Team at the Office of Climate Change. Dimitri. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I think if the question had been, is Europe a leader, I would say, yes, Europe is a leader, but that's not the question. The question is, is Europe falling behind? Uh, and I think Europe is falling behind and losing some of its lead. Uh, you know, historically, some of Europe's strongest economies in Scandinavia, in Germany, uh, have been amongst those that have taken social uh, and environmental sustainability most seriously. Uh, and I agree with Jason to some extent. I think it's sort of woven into the, uh, the fabric of social con uh, consciousness uh, in Europe, perhaps more than any other global region. So that's why uh, we do have a lead. But I do think that the euro area in particular is now distracted. Uh, and is losing its lead, and perhaps the most blatant symptom of that is the collapse in the price of uh, emissions trading certificates in the European Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, which brings us to the second part of the question, what can be done about it? Um, well, I think the first thing that has to be done, the big elephant in the room, the source of the distraction is, of course, the, uh, the euro area crisis. Uh, and until action is taken to make the euro area a little bit more like an optimal currency area, which will inevitably mean uh, some mutualization of key member state liabilities, it will inevitably mean a more federal union with shared fiscal responsibilities and mechanisms for cross-border flows to prevent the build-up of the kinds of imbalances that have caused problems in Europe. Unless that's undertaken, it's going to be very difficult to push on uh, growth at any level. However, uh, at the same time, you do need a growth strategy. You do need a program to encourage private sector uh, investment to stimulate growth. And I would argue that green investment has to be uh, at the heart of that program. Why? Because there's no shortage of private money in the European economy. Uh, net savings are at record levels. There's just a shortage of perceived opportunities. In fact, there's so many net savings on the market, they've been dumped uh, on the market so that global risk-free interest rates have fallen to below zero in real terms for 20 years, an extraordinary state of affairs. That's not because businesses don't see opportunity in transitioning to resource-efficient world. They know that's how the world's going to be. There is, a, if you like, a coiled spring of pent-up entrepreneurship and investment just waiting for a clear and credible policy signal in order for that money, that private money, to be leveraged. Uh, but if governments don't ask, governments won't get. 
Uh, and you know, I think if they don't do that soon, we'll miss this incredible opportunity now because there's no crowding out during a demand recession. Um, to leverage investment, to create employment, to stimulate growth, and leave a large lasting legacy in resource efficient infrastructure that we need. If we wait five years till the economy is at full pelt, will be you know green investment will crowd out alternative green jobs will crowd out alternatives. We will really look back and kick ourselves that we missed this fantastic and unique opportunity. Thank you. Tom Murley is director of HG Capital, where he leads the renewable energy team and is responsible for the Renewable Power Partners Funds. And uh, he has more than 15 years' experience in providing equity finance to the US and EU conventional and renewable power sectors. Tom. Thank you. I think, is Europe falling behind? No. Is it in danger? Yes. But I also think we have to ask some questions a little bit. Is, is it falling behind because others are coming on? Others are growing more quickly, which I think is a good thing globally. It's a fair question. Also, I think that perception depends on the growth very much about who you are. If you're a wind turbine maker, solar panel maker, capital goods maker, yeah, you're falling away from growth because Asia can make it cheaper just as they do in pretty much other, every capital goods sector. So from that perspective, we're losing out on the green growth. And frankly, I think that's probably a little bit irreversible. I think on the other hand, when you look at the conditions in Europe, what we need to do is come to, shall we say, a low carbon 2.0. We've been in 1.0, feed-in tariffs, heavy government regulation for a while, but now we're sitting here with mature systems. We're beginning to understand the complexities of integrating renewables and carbon savings and low carbon. And we're at the forefront of innovation of how this stuff is actually going to work in practice when we move from the relatively low penetration levels today. And let's face it, you know, Germany with 15% renewables penetration is pretty low level compared to where everyone wants to go. And there's a tremendous opportunity here, I think, for Europe to innovate around new structures that take us, you know, Europe was the leader in going from, you know, zero to 15. Well, now we need to be the leader in how we integrate the higher levels where it gets more challenging. So we have to think about a new model about this. The other thing I would think about is falling behind in low carbon is let's define what's low carbon. And I'm gonna throw one of these things out there. We should be thinking about gas as low carbon. And when you think about how we've won the argument these days, how many utilities are talking about building coal-fired power plants in Europe? None. How many are building coal-fired power plants in the U.S.? None. They all want to build low-carbon generation, so we've got a great opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, I'm just going to use my prerogative to uh, ask a couple of questions to the panel. Um, Dimitri, your point was that there's no shortage of cash, yeah. which is absolutely true. I mean, we're sitting on mountains of cash. Um, the uncertainty in the Eurozone obviously makes it very difficult for people to invest. Um, and you said there's a shortage of perceived opportunities. Um, I wonder if the panel could all just address this question. I mean, you know, if business, if green growth is so obviously good, both for the bottom line and for the environment, why are we seeing such a shortage of investment? Because it's also, you, you, if you look back beyond the current recession, we weren't on such a great trajectory before yeah. either. So could you just address that? Do you want, do you want to start on yeah, that and then I'll I bring mean, other people in? I'll start with throwing in one word, change. Change is always difficult and left to their own devices, entities tend to avoid change because uh, you know, winners tend to not know who they are from the change, uh, or at least not as clearly as the losers who know exactly who they are. Businesses, unless they have a clear signal, will probably prefer to carry on do th doing things the way they've always done them. They may know that the world will transition to becoming resource uh, efficient, but they may not uh, want to invest now in new kit uh, to retool and reskill their workforce, to change their uh, production uh, uh, supply lines, and so on, unless they feel that there's a very clear signal which allows them to make money not just in 5, 10, 20 years' time, but immediately. So what they tend to say is, yeah, we get this, at least the more enlightened businesses, we get this, um, but not today. If government isn't willing to undertake even uh, its share of the policy risk, which government controls, um, then why should we sink some of our hard-earned cash into something that is vulnerable to a reversal of policy in two, three, four years' time? Better to stick it into something which at least we're we know we're going to get our money back uh, and put it into global government bonds. So that's the kind of environment they're in. But the flip side of that, of course, is that you know, because this is long-term credible and because there is this money, it doesn't take very much in terms of a policy signal, 
which doesn't require much fiscal outlay, by the way. You know, carbon taxes and uh, cap and trade raise revenues. Standards and regulations don't cost very much. It doesn't take much of a signal to leverage those massive uh, amounts of uh, private, uh, private liquidity. James, do you want to come in on this? And, and maybe um, the rest of you could also address this question of, is it possible for governments which have a four- to five-year horizon ever to actually satisfy business about that investment perspective? Do, they, do, do business just not going to have to get on with it and stop blaming government? Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, uh, picking up where uh, Dimitri was talking about, I'm a very strong believer in using markets and, uh, and competition to leverage the resources to get this done. And one of the things I wanted to develop from my initial uh, statement was about the emissions trading system in Europe. So, I mean, that would be a pricing signal. As you say, Dimitri, if that pricing signal could be installed, it could potentially have a huge effect. And yet, I think it's uh, seven euros a tonne today, which is a wholly inadequate pricing signal. And I think, to me, this is you know, fundamentally important, but fundamentally representative of the difficulty that Europe has in organizing itself to do the right thing. Um, and there have been ad advocates for the sort of thing that needs done, for example, the withdrawal of a billion or so credits from the existing phase of the ETS, the setting of a reserve price for the first phase of auctions post-2020 of the, of the next uh, phase of the ETS. And I'd also suggest uh, setting out what in 2030 will be the number of credits that are available. And if all of those things could be done, I think that would have a huge stimulus uh, on the economy. It would also... Uh, make sense of a number of things that are people are trying to do at a, at a smaller level, such as the argument within the UK about the uh, carbon emissions from the power sector in 2030. If you had any, a general statement uh, from the ETS that encompassed all of that, we'd have a much more effective and substantial policy signal. Okay. Jason, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both Dimitri and James on the unique opportunity that Europe has. Of course, it's even broader than just green, but but the growth opportunity to invest now in sustainable infrastructure. But to your question about this cash and why we're not using it, if it's a, it's a, if it's a long-term growth opportunity, I think the important thing to remember is if, if government has a four to five year window, which by the way, it doesn't, I wish it did, it would even be an improvement on what we've got today. Um, companies have a one or two year window, let's be honest. And the growth, in terms of long-term economic growth, you're talking about 20 year windows. And so the whole, the whole issue, I think, the reason green growth is long-term growth promoting is because it's taking into account much longer term uh, growth opportunities, right? It's thinking about the resource scarcity that's going to kick in in the long term. It's thinking about the environmental damage that's going to have huge cost effects in the long term. And so no one's ready to, to invest on that basis. Uh, governments aren't yet ready to put policy in on that basis, and so it looks like a better opportunity to companies to take the, the, the quick returns, and for companies it is in, in most cases, although many may find themselves with very large stranded assets um, in, the, in the kind of medium term. But, but, but in the short term, it, it looks quite good, but it is costly in that, in that initial window, right? You do need policy to get yourself over that two, three, four, five year window when it's costly before you see the benefits in terms of exactly. reduced costs, in terms of reduced resource dependency and things like that. So there's no contradiction in the fact that there's an initial cost and a long term economic growth benefit. Yeah. But you may not be the CEO who reaps the benefit in 10 years time, right. as it well, were. That's true as well. Totally. Exactly. Well, perhaps just a few comments. I mean, I'm, I certainly interact every day with customers who are making long term investment decisions. In particular, in the energy industry, we are talking about customers, customers of GE investing into assets with a lifetime measured in decades. So I think companies are absolutely comfortable with making long-term investment decisions. Quite frankly, this is how the energy and utility industry has been built. But a couple of complicating factors. When we are talking about low-carbon technologies, be it wind, be it solar, be it nuclear, they're, from an investment perspective, very different compared to fossil fuel power plants. Fossil fuel power plants have an upfront investment, but a big chunk of their cost is really the cost of the fuel you have to buy for running them because you're burning it. This is a very different capital and investment structure compared to these low carbon technologies where basically you put most of your capital in at the very beginning and that the fuel, in the case of renewables, is free yeah. or in the case of nuclear, it's really a relatively small percentage of the total operating costs of the plant. That, of course, means anybody who has to make investments into those low-carbon technologies is going to be ultra-sensitive to changes in legislation affecting the value of the assets invested into. Mm -hmm. And that means a stable regulatory environment is absolutely critical, a must-have 
for encouraging private investments into these low carbon power generating assets. And with the nature of CNC's investments, which I just described, it's, it's a much bigger issue compared with other power generating technologies. So I, I think as long as we can get political stakeholders towards a point where they are agreeing on a long-term investment framework, as difficult as this may be in democracies, I think it would help the entire process a lot. But it's still not a no-brainer because, um, yeah, there may be a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines, but cash is not necessarily capital. Tom? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree. I don't think there's capital out there. I think there's a very high hurdle for it to come into this industry because, frankly, the performance record is abysmal, and we need to do something about it. If you look across Europe of the renewable, the wind turbine companies, you look at the ones that went, you know, listed on the, on the exchanges over the last six or seven years at the height of the bubble, today they trade on average at 50% below their IPO price. So if you invested 100, you're worth 50 today. And investors look at this. Investors aren't looking for an easy message. I, we recently completed our fundraising, which is Europe's largest renewable energy fund. We don't take technology risks. We're trying to do the safe things investors want, invest in long-term infrastructure. I had over 400 investor meetings over 20 months with what ended up about 180 global investors. At the end of the day, I got 21 of those to sign up for the fund. And we've got a track record, and we are actually making money for our clients. That, in the fundraising world, is an incredible record. You know, about a 12% success rate conversion on sales. And these guys want to believe, but they sit there and they look at what Spain has done on the retroactive side, they look at the losses in the public sector, they look at losses in other private funds, they look at, you know, the, you know, the global clean tech VC industry, you know, they look at Solyndra, they look at all of these things and say, from a, you know, a pension and insurance company, I'm here to make money to pay pensions and pay insurance policies. This doesn't look like a sector I can raise money. Can I, it's okay, not that easy. Great, can I ask a supplementary, but yeah. to come back to something you said earlier, um, because you talked about going from low carbon 1.0 to low carbon 2.0. Yeah. Um, if you've read Dieter Helm's new book, The Carbon Crunch, I mean, he is arguing very, very strongly that actually we are at low carbon 1.0, that the renewable technologies are not up to it yet, and that we should do what I think you were partially suggesting, we should embrace gas as an interim technology, and we should put more money into R&D to actually develop the 2.0 renewable technologies, which he is saying do not yet exist. Actually, I think, the, I think a lot of the renewable technologies are here. You just take a look at what's happening with solar PV and, and the cost reductions. Wind turbine technology continues to get better, and the cost keeps coming out of it. Gas is quicker. Gas replacing coal is absolutely critical. What we really need in the investment in this is the grid, because no matter how you cut it, the renewables are in remote locations. They aren't where the load centers are. Okay. And you've got the whole intermittency issues. And actually, the grid is at the heart of this for Europe. Right. Does anybody agree with me that we're nowhere near low carbon 2.0 and we need to stop building 1.0 wind turbines? Or does everybody Could, agree yeah, with I mean, me? I, I don't know that I agree necessarily with that, because I think onshore wind looks like it's cost competitive at the moment. But it does raise a sort of fundamental point. And, if I could just say something about uh, the willingness of companies to invest. Uh, you, people may be aware there was a communique signed into Doha by now over 100 companies saying that a price needed to be put on carbon. And unless a price was, be, was put on carbon, it's going to be very difficult, difficult for companies to respond. So companies will respond, provided they can recover the cost in the marketplace, so the price isn't there on carbon. It's uh, close to impossible for them to do that. And I was speaking to a guy in Shell who's been behind that. Shell and BP have both signed. Um, he's finding a little bit, they're over 100 now, but this is a very serious commitment. And for that reason, they're finding it difficult to get more companies uh, to sign up. But the fact that some very major carbon intensive companies have signed is really quite significant because for some companies, it's quite easy to sign. But when you're really in the big carbon business, then signing one of those things is, is a, a very significant thing to do. But to the fundamentals, and it was my, made the comment about option management for technologies. And, and I think one of Europe's problems has been it's been picking technologies. It set goals rather in terms of outcomes, in terms of technologies that it wanted to see installed when it didn't have enough information about those technologies. And the sort of government framework I think that's needed is a framework in R&D 
and I'm not sure Europe's as good as China and, and the US on that, a framework for demonstration projects, which in other circumstances you might not need, but time is really, really short. So we need to get things evaluated, and we shouldn't make decisions until we've done the evaluation. So we should be putting billions behind a range of sensible technologies in order to build the supply chains, in order to help people learn, in order to see how far we can get the cost curve. And then into the third piece is to let the market take over, so a price for power and a price for carbon, and let the market find the way. And that's the infrastructure that should be set up. Right. And Thank we shouldn't you. be sitting here talking about which technology is best, because until we do that, we don't know. So we need to price. Do either of you want to come in briefly on that? Well, I think I think it's an excellent point. I mean, I agree with I couldn't agree with him more. I, th I think especially if we're going to talk about the question around falling behind, I think it is actually the crucial bridge from innovation into deployment, where Europe is probably most at risk of falling behind. I think there's still an innovation capital, but many countries are catching up very fast. I mean, comp other countries are just you could just rapidly in terms of the number of scientific um, uh, skills they have and, and the money they're investing in it, catching up very fast. But many are also doing better and going stronger when it comes to that um, demonstration and moving it past just um, initial thinking. And I think Europe has not gotten its act together um, in really thinking about how are we testing these options, how are we testing them quickly so we can move and really transform the pathway. I mean, the big thing about green growth is that you need a radical shift from pathways of development that were, in this case, with energy fossil fuel dependent, but, but had significant infrastructure behind them. And you, you can't do that sort of incrementally. You need to take really whole systems, um, whether it's energy networks or whether it's even transportation systems, and you need to test them out at serious scale. And Europe hasn't, hasn't done that while, you know, Korea, for instance, and uh, some other countries are, are willing to take those, those chances. So, um, you know, in that, in that case, I think it's very true, and Europe will have to move much more quickly if it wants to. Did you want to come? Yeah, just to, to build on this, I mean, at the end of the day, I, Camilla, I don't think that this is a technology question. If, if a smart combination, for example, of gas-fired gas power plants and renewables can make a huge dent into today's carbon emission. I mean, from the 31 gigatons of carbon being released last year, I mean, 45% of this is coming from, from coal-fired power plants. We see the U.S. has been able over the last couple of years to reduce their carbon emissions by 450 million tons just because a lot of their power generating capacity has shifted from coal to natural gas. So it's really not about we have to find new leapfrog technology to be even able to make a dent into our carbon emissions. A stable regulatory framework encouraging the right investment decisions basically based on the existing technologies, that would do it. That would be just fine. Great. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll add a little more optimism on that. I mean, I fundamentally disagree that, that, that we've not moved on. Uh, yes, sure, um, gas might play a transitional role, though there are risks uh, about assumptions on gas prices that, 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 that many people are making. But, you know, onshore wind is already competitive with uh, conventional fossil fuels. You know, you, there are separate arguments about uh, uh, local environmental issues. Solar PV costs have fallen by a factor of five in the last five years. I mean, these are extraordinary transformations. <laughs> that they haven't happened in a vacuum. They don't happen because governments dumped lots of R&D money on them. Um, that's like pushing on a piece of string. They happen because serious businesses see a market in this, in China, in Germany, in Europe, and elsewhere. And by scaling up through experimentation, through learning and experience, these prices tend to come down. So there is an upfront cost, but these prices are coming down dramatically. What you need to pull through that innovation on entrepreneurship is the belief in the private sector that they're going to make money out of this, that there will be uh, a market. And that requires exactly, as was just said, a framework, a policy framework to encourage that investment. Brilliant. Um, I think some of you are already tweeting. If you haven't noticed, there's a hashtag CarbonQT. Um, We're not allowed Jamie, to do you have any? Do you have any tweets? Okay. Oh, sorry. I thought you gave me a wink. Okay. So if you want, if you want to um, use that hashtag, you're welcome to. Well, can I challenge? Can I challenge yes. Torian? I'm just in terms of in terms of this the idea that we're going to put a framework together and it's going to work and I, and I mean this is a question I'm not I'm not certain I think you might know the answer um, how is that going to work in things like a smart grid electricity network I mean you, there's so many there's you know you've got a in general you've got a public sector you know procuring entity you know you're going to put in a carbon price and somehow without any sort of demonst large demonstration programs that are publicly funded without any um, attempt to see what works in this very complicated network it's going to kind of happen in time with just, or did you see in your policy framework a more active intervention in terms of large demonstration? Because I, 
I've always thought that that's a missing piece, but I, I'm interested in your opinion, because I think you've... Well, I, I, I think you, you obviously need a, a little bit more detailed, let's say, government intervention, certain elements of the, of the market. But at the end of the day, again, the U.S. is my most favorite example. The simple fact that gas is less expensive, substantially less expensive, uh, or running a gas-fired power plant is less expensive than running a coal-fired power plant, this has created the most impressive reduction in, car in carbon emissions a country has ever seen. I mean, that's a wonderful demonstration for market force. And as I, I, that's I, so easy compared to integrating, you know, 60 or 70 percent renewables into an electricity grid. Yeah, you know, but, where, but, but you see, I, my, my concern is because, I, you see, I have always, over the, for the last couple of years while I'm doing this job, I have hearing... I've been seeing lots of very committed, very smart people talking about reducing, reducing the carbon footprint by 80 or 90 percent of a geography or a country. But since it's such a long shot, actually nothing really happens. I'm much more comfortable with a more incremental approach saying, let's go down by 50 percent, stabilize the kind of emissions we have right now, and then let's do incremental improvements to further go down that road of reducing carbon emissions, but actually let's get something done. And in order to get something done, you've got to rely on market forces. For sure. yeah. James, Can I, can I yeah. um, add, add something to that, if, if I may, that may bridge the gap a little bit? Uh, because I think Jason makes a very good point about infrastructure. So, I mean, I, I already said I believe strongly in competition and markets, which I do. Uh, but you've got to create an infrastructure within, with which the private sector can interact. And of course, and, and the infrastructure of distribution of electricity is just one part of the distribution of gas. And then you begin to realize heat is a very big problem. And you begin to realize that there are solutions relevant to electricity that are also relevant to heat. So the ability to take an overview of infrastructure is a really crucial issue in solving those problems in the most cost-effective way. And almost by its nature, you can't create a too competitive environment in, in that. We have a system in the UK that's being extended with grid getting, getting more powers. I think uh, one of our problems, I think, has been our reluctance to tamper, to feel that we were tampering with markets and our concern about doing, doing so effectively, and therefore we've left things a little bit late. And there are examples in the United States where you have a, a system balancer or a strategic buyer that I think are very effective. We need to model those things in. And actually, um, not to drone on for too long, but I think we should give some credit to the energy bill. Uh, because the energy bill, this sort of phased approach that I've been trying to describe, where we do a bit of option management, find out which works best, is written into the heart of the energy bill, although not well publicized. Yeah. And equally, the management of the infrastructure through which the private sector can operate is written into the energy bill as well. So there's an institutional framework that needs to be established alongside these market mechanisms. Okay, now there's two roving microphones, so if you do want to ask a question, I'm going to open it up. I'm, I'm going to ask one more myself while you're thinking of your questions, but if you can put your hand up so you can get hold of a microphone, um, and I'll just ask another, another question while, while you're thinking. Um, I just wanted to go slightly broader, really, and come back to something that Jason said about consumers, and you said consumers don't care in the rest of the world implying that they, they do care in Europe. And I, I, we've always sort of felt in Europe, I think, and in this country, that, that we've, we've sort of slightly had the moral high ground, haven't we? And now we're seeing austerity, we're seeing Germany come off the nuclear framework, we're seeing a whole, a whole series of changes. And I wonder whether, whether you think that consumers in Europe do still care any more than anywhere, anywhere else. And how can we get people to take these issues more seriously? Because ultimately you are, I mean, the energy bill is asking consumers in the UK to pay more for their energy and people are pretty furious about it. So is there a way that we can change, frame that debate to somehow bring consumers on side with this? Good question. Um, Tom? I, uh, first, just on the, on the EMR, it's about better communication. And I think the EMR gets billed as, oh, we're doing these renewables, it's going to cost more. Simple fact is that the UK's energy infrastructure is old and needs to be replaced. And it doesn't matter if you pick high carbon or low carbon, there's a mass amount of capital investment that has to go in to renew the system, and people's bills are going to go up no matter what the choice is. And I think people need, the politicians they don't, they don't need to make that, that clear. They don't understand that, though. But I don't think people understand that. They think, oh, we're doing this green stuff, so it's more expensive. It's going to be more expensive no matter what you choose. Mm. Then people have to better articulate the arguments how green can be cheaper. I think in terms of consumers... I think it differs from country to country. I think the German consumer is willing to tolerate it. The big question right now is German industry willing to tolerate the increased cost, because that's where most of the noise is coming from. 
And I think, you know, in some places, you need to get stories out. Italy's got a ton of solar, which everyone thinks, gee, it's really expensive with very high tariff. But on the other hand, the great story, and this is about communication, the solar in Italy is shaving the cost of peak pricing from gas-fired power. It's hitting NL, basically in its EBITDA line, but the cost of putting 12,000 megawatts of solar in Italy is completely offset by lower gas prices and peak power prices. And so it's actually a no net cost to the consumer. These are the kind of stories that need to get out. It's communication. Dimitri. Could I add to that? I mean, I think that's absolutely right. It's definitely communication. If people understood that, um, that, that we're in this recession right now, uh, precisely because everybody is simultaneously trying to cut back on spending and cut back on costs. So uh, businesses are cutting back on investment and employment. Uh, banks are retrenching on credit. Consumers are saving more. And uh, they're doing so because of the perfectly rational belief that they don't trust the economic environment. Well, of course, if everybody behaves in the same way, the collective response is for those uh, expectations to become self-fulfilling and you get the recession you were worried about. Um, it's cutting costs that has got us into this uh, excessive uh, recession. Every uh, stimulus plan that has been successful in the past, whether it be electrification or Roosevelt's New Deal or rearming and going to war with your neighbor involves increasing costs. You have to pay for diggers on the ground. You have to pay for factories to be built. You have to pay for people to be employed. Labor, if you want to uh, increase employment, labor is a cost. So you have to acknowledge that part of getting the economy out of this mess requires generating certain costs. The question is, how do you do it most effectively, and what is the legacy that you leave? People don't, unfortunately, understand that, and we could have been out of this recession right now if there was a common discourse and a common understanding and a clear line of sight as to how we address that. There isn't. Okay, look okay. we've got a couple of questions from the audience. So can you, just, if you want to come in on this, just come in briefly, and then we'll very, go to Very the... briefly, because I, I don't want to stop people getting a chance to ask their questions. So I, I'm a Keynesian too, uh, Dimitri. Um, I'm not sure I want to start another, a third world war in order to get us out of it, although there are some... <laughs> go to war in resources. <laughs> <laughs> go to war in renewables. Can I make a point about the consumer? Because interestingly, the Carbon Trust did some research on this, and when we say it's the UK or the European consumer that's concerned, actually it's fascinating to find out there's a Chinese consumer is much more concerned about environmental matters and was much more likely to reward or punish our corporate entity that it thought it was doing the right thing on sustainability James, was that local and climate pollution? change. Was that local pollution or was that well, global? Well, actually it was climate change. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, but you're right. They'd be stimulate, you're, you're right. I mean, there are big problems with local pollution mm. in China. Of course, that switched people onto the concern. Mm. We also published some research today, I think, Tom, which is fascinating. It, it shows that the corporate world is not as concerned as it ought to be about general matters of sustainability, although interestingly, B2B companies seem to be more concerned than B2C companies, which is kind of a negative signal on the interest of the consumer, the feedback that companies are getting from the consumer. Mm. And I would caution this. Here's the point I'm heading for. I mean, we, we're, I think we're through the euphoric phase of a wave of consumer concern carrying us through to a green future. We've done all that. They've been excited about it. They're a bit bored now. They're a bit worried about whether climate change is real and a bit worried about the cost yeah. of it, even though we supply all the information in the world. And to suppose that we can rekindle that enthusiasm, I think, is a, is a dangerous naivety on our part, so, which isn't to say we write off the consumer, but I think we've got to be realistic about where the consumer will be with this. I think we've got to continue with consumer understanding and information. We've got at least to get the, the uh, permission of the consumer, let's hope support, and let's hope the consumer will continue to demand that its political parties put these things into the manifestos and policies run. But I worry not only about that, about consumer enthusiasm, I also worry about how much demand management energy efficiency we're really going to get. And the risk is if we overassume that, there will be things we ought to be doing on the supply side that we're that we're not doing. So I, I guess my general That's point is point. this is something for yeah. companies and something for us to help the consumer understand, but to suppose that this will be done on a wave of consumer support, I think is risky.